Okay, I'm a wanderer, so we're going to let me walk and talk if that's what you're going to do. We'll try to keep this fun and informal. Uh, I'd like to thank the Community Foundation for Muskegon for bringing me here. Uh, it's very auspicious uh, time for you guys. Very excited to uh, have a chance to look around and see these last couple of days. I've met some amazing people. It seems like Muskegon is doing many, many things right. So hopefully what I'm going to talk about here today is sort of uh, preaching to the choir. You're going to see, hey, why are we doing that? Yes, we're, you know, we're, we're, we have this in the planning stages, so uh, maybe it invites some of you who haven't gotten the game yet, who are maybe on the sidelines waiting to, uh, to get in and uh, make this community a better place. Maybe it gives you the, uh, the courage and the impetus and, uh, to jump in and start swimming with the rest of uh, the paintings as well. Okay, so uh, with that, let's get started. In March of this year, there was a wedding in Durham, North Carolina, and it had brides, it had grooms, it had flowers, tuxedos, white dresses, it had receptions, it had cake, and all the trappings that finished the wedding. It had 1,600 brides and grooms, and they weren't married to each other. They were married in the city of Durham. It was called the largest civic union in history. These folks got together as part of this uh, volunteer-coordinated effort. They married the city of Durham, and their vows included uh, promises to keep the streets clean and safe, to vote responsibly, to cherish diversity, uh, to buy local, to support local arts and culture. Um, this was an expression of the love and the affection that people have for their states. They decided they wanted to raise a little bit of money for some local charities. They set a modest goal of about $12,000. They more than doubled that. Key point, again, none of this was done by the city. This was all done by volunteers who wanted to express the love that they had for their city. Around the same time in Detroit, the mayor of Detroit, Dave Ding, receives, a, receives a, a, a tweet. Somebody suggests, he says, how about a statue of Robocop in the city of Detroit? For those of you who don't know, Robocop was actually sat in the city of Detroit. Uh, the mayor, who is a tweeter, uh, who I think the rather tersely replied, there are no plans for a statue of Robocop in Detroit, thank you very much. Too late. And I deal with it. And you know how it happens, it happens with the internet. Immediately people are buzzing about the idea. It's like, I don't think that's going to be a So within a matter of hours, a Facebook group is formed. People are tweeting about this stuff. They decide, hey, we're going to make this happen. And instead of actually going to the city for an arts grant or apply to uh, you know, the arts council for something, they say, we're going to fund it ourselves. So they went on Kickstarter, which is this crowdsourcing, uh, fundraising, uh, online service. They set a modest goal of about $50,000 to build the statue. Within a matter of weeks, this story gets picked up by the national media. Um, it's, it's buzzed about people who are talking about it, and despite what the folks called irony right now, they raised over $67,000 to build a statue of Robocop. Now, what do those things have in common? They start with people who are absolutely in love with their city. People who are going to do extraordinary things over and above, not necessarily because they're being paid, but because they feel an emotional connection to the place that they live. They want to do something. They want to get in the game, and they want to make something happen. Now, every place has people that love it. It shouldn't surprise us uh, that uh, there are people in our community, and I'm sure you know them. I'm sure many people are actually these people. So again, it's not preaching to the choir. But between 2008 and 2010, the Gallup organization did what we call the Soul of the Community Survey. They said, let's take the temperature of our relationship with our cities. And unfortunately, they found that that relationship is actually not very good. 40% of people uh, in this, excuse me, the survey actually was uh, 40,000 people were in 26 cities. So this was a pretty comprehensive. Most of the folks said that they are unattached to their cities. 36% said that they were neutral. And just 24% said that they were attached to their community. Less than one quarter. And attachment isn't even love. Attachment means, OK, I vote, I volunteer, and I may be part of the community watch. Congratulations, you're attached. It doesn't sound very romantic. It doesn't sound very meaningful. Uh, and we know that love is actually even further out on the end of that, uh, that bell curve. But uh, you know, why so few uh, attachments? We'll get into that here in a second. What they also did uh, was very important. Is they looked at the economic uh, impact of uh, in those particular cities as well. They found some very interesting things. The cities that had the highest levels of, of loyalty, passion, and engagement also had the corresponding and highest levels of local GDP and economic vitality. It was one of those uh, interesting statistics that moves together. They weren't going to go so far as to say that these were causal, but they were one of those that interestingly moved together. So when you have high levels of passion and engagement, you have high levels of GDP. Lower levels, lower levels of GDP. Those are the kinds of statistics, uh, statistics that we should pay attention to. I know that we all kind of do. So how 
How did we get to this sorry state of affairs when we don't really care about our cities? Well, certainly public policy goes into it, uh, bad planning. Uh, places that have uh, isolated us into sort of mono, uh, monocultural enclaves that have privileged the car or human connection, uh, bad design, years of neglect, and you have what James Hunsler calls places not worth caring about. We've all seen these places. We all know these places. And we have to figure out how to change that and to change that conversation and to re-engage with our cities. Because love matters. When children are loved, they cry. Pets, plants, and objects, we all know this. We've seen it. And I use the term objects, and that's an important distinction here, because we don't necessarily think about objects being loved and thriving. Yes. Look at this car. Does this car look like a typical Michigan car during the winter? I, I grew up in Ohio, so I know this car. I probably drove this car so far. And this sort of reflects the nature of the relationship that we have with this particular object. It's utilitarian. It gets us from point A to point B. You know, and we occasionally do the maintenance, we wash it, and things like that. But we all know the difference of a car of somebody that loves cars, right? We know these guys. They're the ones around there on the weekends with a diaper wax in the car. They change the oil even if they're not uh, driving it. And they invest in some emotional content and their love and affection and their identity into that object, and it absolutely shows. What happens when more of us start investing some of our emotional content, our identity in our places? Don't you think that our cities can shine like this car? I submit that they can and they do. How to get there? That's the next question, I suppose. What is it that we both love and hate about our cities? And this is a question I've been asking people for a long time. Um, and it's interesting because the answers um, were pretty universal, depending not you know, from city to city, country to country. What we hate about cities tends to be pretty obvious. We hate big things. We hate traffic. We hate uh, parking. Uh, uh, we hate the education system. We hate bad planning. We hate sprawl, ugliness. We hate the pothole filled with streets. Right? There's nothing that vexes us more than the pothole. Right? Um, and I, I like the potholes. To, uh, to hang nails or paper cuts. So if you're thinking they're all over there, or, and you know where it is on your driveway to work, it's all over the place to talk. Uh, but they're hardly like that. And the thing about these problems is you can spend a ton of money fixing parking, fixing the pond, uh, fixing the education system, all of these kinds of things, and they don't necessarily engender love. Think about it. You can fix all the problems, somebody's going to say, well, you know, the streets don't suck quite so bad. That's not love. You can invest a lot of money, but you don't get a whole lot of emotional return those particular things. Yet we have clearly, I think we've developed what I call this asphalt and pop mentality. This is what we think, uh, this is what politicians, I think, believe most of us care about. Because when asked and when told, most people say, oh, what do we care about? Well, you know, about the potholes. So I think politicians respond in kind. They start building the potholes, they think this is what's going to make it happen. Well, it's really not the case. Um, I submit to you that if places are merely paved roads, police, and fire services, then there's nothing that keeps us in one place versus another. We need to expand our definition of what we consider essentials and add to it. I mean, we've got to fill potholes, I know that. But we've got to add to that. We've got to add some things that speak to our higher aspirations, like, like fun, and beauty, and engagement. Things that actually make cities matter. Because this is where most of our thinking around cities begins and ends. We say cities have to be both functional and safe. And I agree, they absolutely do need to be functional and safe. The problem is, is when we stop at that particular point, we know where we are. The trick is, we've got to go higher. This appeals to our higher selves. Well, why can't our cities be comfortable? Uh, why can't our cities be convivial? In the sense that they bring us together. Why can't they be interesting? And maybe even more fundamental than that, why can't they be fun? When was the last time we had a, kind of, a conversation about making the city more fun? Yet, as Americans, we spend more money on fun than we do on, 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 on food and shelter. Why? Think about that. Fun is incredibly important. Uh, in our way of thinking about cities. Yet yeah, we stop at the functional and safe. So I challenge all of you guys the next time you're at a council meeting, you're at a planning meeting, something like that, you know, they're talking about all those different things, and somebody's got to stand up and say, where's the fun? Seriously, I want somebody to do that. Where's the fun? Because the things we love about cities, they tend to be small things, small intimate things. I call them the, the love notes. They're the chocolate on the pillow, they're the cherry on top of the Sunday, and they are the handwritten goes with the gift, right? Uh, gentlemen, we all have that experience. We know that a handwritten note is actually more important than the gift. Guys, if you're with me, has anyone ever forgotten the, the note that goes with the gift? You know what I'm talking about. Because it says something. It 
takes thought, it takes an emotional connection, and you take that time, you take that, that moment of interest. So these little things, a favorite place that people watch, a dog, uh, a dog park, uh, a little pocket park, um, your favorite restaurant, a little street restaurant, those are the things that we respond to. Those are the things that we feel that have an outsized impact on the way we feel about cities. And I call these love notes. So I've got a few love notes I thought I'd share with you guys to get you guys thinking about this stuff. Who's been to Times Square in the last couple of years? Anyone been back to New York? Remember the old Times Square where, you know, these were, uh, these streets were covered in cabs and traffic, and basically if you felt like you were looking around, you were gonna, basically you were risking your life. Because if you, you step off the curb, you're gonna get whacked, right? And of course the New Yorkers are all pushing through, trying to get from place to place. They took the busiest intersection in one of the busiest cities in the world, and they made it a pedestrian practice. They put in chairs, they put in wi -Fi. and it's fabulous. It's a wonderful respite to go and sit and actually watch. You can actually look at all those signs, it's a great place to people watch in the heart of New York. That's the love. In the great city of New York, they're very small. Also in New York City, they took an old white elephant of a, uh, an elevated railroad track down in the meatpacking district that had sat landed for 30 odd years, people trying to figure out what to do with it. And they turned it into an elevated park. For instance, it's called Highline Park. And it's fabulous. You wouldn't think that being nearly two stories above the city would totally change your perspective on the city, but it absolutely does. You walk up there, and it's absolutely magical. This was even in winter, you know, it's, it's brown, but it still had this kind of compelling beauty. And what's interesting is that uh, Highline Park has become such a destination, not only for tourists, but people now want to live near this park, and it's actually having an effect that usually is only reserved for like a metro station. People actually stop now want to buy near a metro station, and now want to buy and live near Highline Park. We have a limited range on this. Okay, there we go. Millennium Park in Chicago. This is a big logo. This is a $475 million logo. It is 12 dozen rows of the giant box of chocolates delivered in a Lexus kind of logo. <laughs> I know we don't have the money to do these kinds of things, but Millennium Park illustrates a very important concept. It illustrates the concept of play. If you've ever been there and you approach a cloud game, which is what this is called, but everyone calls it the theme, right? Because no one calls the, the, the public archives active property, and this is the theme. What people do is they find their reflection in the beam, they take their picture. You see kids lying underneath them, you know, finding their, their, their sort of distorted, sort of like a, a funhouse mirror, if you will, looking around. And it's wonderful. Then you go right next to that, and these two giant columns, and they have these video faces uh, in the change. And then they have water paintings. And during the summer, it's basically an above ground pool for their kids. Now, by the way, I know you guys are actually putting this in, it's something very much like this. It's going to open up tomorrow. Good for you. Because this is fun. This is engaging. This is how we play in our city. And play is incredibly important. Think about our personal relationships. The ability to play with our friends, to play with our partner, that's wonderful. That's the kind of which obviously we cherish the most. But we don't necessarily think about building that into the relationship we have with our cities. We've got to figure out how to play with our cities and how our, how our cities can play with us. Something a little more manageable in terms of uh, uh, scope and budget. This is a street piano project. It actually started in England when a guy who was moving in Birmingham couldn't get his piano up the stage and it was flat. So he put a sign out on it that says, play it. And of course, people decide, you know, let's play on uh, this thing. So artists then took this idea and they created their Play Me On Years project. And these pianos have literally traveled all around the world. In fact, I think there was, uh, they, they came to uh, Art Prize last year that were part of that. But the whole idea here is a piano. You know, somebody sits down and starts playing, and a, a crowd forms. And you have this moment where you're together, you're, you're, you're in shared space, and it's an interesting sort of respite, and it makes you smile. It's one of those lovely little interventions that you, know, you go, oh, that was kind of cool. And it doesn't cost a whole lot of money. It does take a little bit of thought and a little bit of uh, uh, creativity to imagine something like that. Now, I have to give a props here uh, to the student for the art class that are happening around town. I thought we saw some of these uh, yesterday when we were touring around. I thought, this is pretty cool. This is one of those little things that makes people smile. And I understand people are really looking forward to it. When there's a new one, they you know, travel around. Hey, did you see the new bike out in the corner of third or wherever? I think that's really wonderful. And what what's even better about this, just want to get the clicker to work. It's even better is the city hasn't decided to take it down yet. Good on you for that. You know, seriously. Uh, city, find a way to accommodate this because this is one of those little things that obviously people have 
That's what we're falling in love with. And then life seems where the place going to show up next. Isn't that a wonderful little thing when you discover you walk down the street and go, hey, that's the thing that's my life. Think about that moment. Well, there's a lot of value in that little moment. Sets those things on fire. 
It's water and fire. It's the most basic thing in the world, and it's fabulous. You walk down the town during the water fire event, you smell that pine uh, smoke, you hear the crackle of the, the fire, you see these dancing shadows that are created by the moving uh, light. It's this wonderful experience. You see people walking around almost in their trance. It's just this wonderful, wonderful uh, time. And it doesn't cost a whole lot of money to do this. And I was actually lucky enough to uh, participate in what they call a lighting ceremony where like the villagers out of uh, Frankenstein would be very tortured to see all down the river, put them into this big sort of curve, and then they end up lighting uh, the, the fire. And that's a wonderful ritual tradition uh, that has become something that locals love and tourists will come to see. Think about that. Especially if you do something that the locals will love, the tourists will love it too. And sometimes uh, I think something we often forget in the mix there. We start thinking about the tourists. Like that. Tourists want to know what the locals think is cool. I wanted to go where, I mean, tell me what the restaurants are, you know, where's the, where the locals go? You know, and I mean, her husband took us to, to the doctor's house. He says, this is where the locals go. He says, this was really cool. So we had a great time because of that. Otherwise, you know, we might end up in, you know, a typical tourist place or something like that. But locals, locals rule. Another ritual tradition. This is an interesting one. They don't always have these quite so high minded. Um, <laughs> anyone here ever heard of a zombie walk? Yeah. Zombie walks, actually, do you know what zombie mecca happens to be? Pittsburgh. Anybody know why? George Romero. Went out front. George Romero, the guy who did Dawn of the Dead, Night of the Living Dead, filmed those movies in Western tradition. In fact, Dawn of the Dead is filmed in the Rogue Mall, which is just outside of Pittsburgh. And that's become sort of uh, the epicenter of zombie culture. You ever read the zombie? You go to a Rogue Mall because that's where the movie was filmed. And in fact, they did the old zombie day there, and they had all of these zombie walks that sort of initiated. By the way, a zombie walk is basically a parade of zombies. You dress up like a zombie, you sort of shamble through downtown, and things like that. They actually had a really involved once we'll get uh, designated victims. People will they'll, they'll be the humans, and they'll actually get like some like entrails from the butcher shop, and stuff them in their clothes. Yeah, you know what comes next. Ooh, yeah. But what's interesting about this, this is actually a picture from the uh, Pittsburgh downtown park show. They embrace this whole zombie culture and said, no, we're moving downtown. We want to be part of what we do as part of the sort of the official business uh, promotion and promoting sort of organization. Because it's authentic and it's fun. Uh, and it says something about the city that they're willing to embrace something as quirky as that. You want to be a local city? You need to be a youth friendly city. And I don't mean just youth friendly in the sense of young professionals. Because we all love the young professionals. When they get their college degree, they've got all the skills we want, we pay a lot of attention to them then, right? We want to have a relationship with them by the time they're 22 and educated. Uh, we need to start thinking about them when they're 13 to 15, a little early, and not quite yet. And that means a couple of things. It means music venues, and this is the one I always tell people. It means skate parks. You know, we say no more kids from the time they're teenagers to the time they you know, get into college, and then we want them to say yes to us when we get out of college. It doesn't happen. We have to figure out a way to start saying yes to them and make them feel like this city is part of what, uh, what they uh, are, are able to do. And find the city to figure out how to make this work. Uh, so I challenge you to figure out maybe ways to become more youth friendly in that sense. Bike friendly. Bike friendly is not just the idea of, uh, uh, of alternative transportation, good for the environment, uh, help, good for the health of the citizens. It is, of course, it's all. By the way, it's fun, too. So that's good stuff. Um, but if you're a bike friendly city, it says something very fundamental. It says that it is not just all about the car. It means that this is a place where people matter, right? It means that we've made some accommodation that says, okay, it's not just about the automobile, we're going to figure out how to make this work for everybody. And if you're a bike unfriendly city, it's kind of the exact opposite. It says, you know, people don't matter, uh, we're not very much environmentally conscious, uh, we're not very much fun, uh, and uh, our, our people are probably not as healthy as they could. So becoming a bike friendly city, uh, changes the way you think about the city. And this actually, uh, actually is a pretty good bike friendly city. Uh, this gentleman here said, if you'd like to see the bike uh, things plow during the winter, which I think is not a bad idea. Just you know, some of the most bike friendly cities in the world are actually in northern climates. If you look at the Scandinavian countries, they figure out a way to make it work. I think we can probably figure out a way to make it work here too. Walkable cities. Walkable does some very same things uh, that uh, the bike do, with, with two other important caveats. Walkable cities allow for improvisation and discovery. Think about it. When you're walking down the street, you're free to go into new shops and restaurants. You go down the street, you've never walked down before. 
Versus when you're driving down to 40 miles an hour, you see a new, you know, a new shop or a new restaurant, you go, oh, that's kind of cool. Do you stop? No. You may be thinking, you don't have to go down to the new turn and the other new turn and come back. No. You may be wanting to come back in your mind. It's like, I should check that out. But when you're walking, you're free to discover. And think about this. Um, how wonderful is it when we discover something new about, you know, an old friend or about a partner? When we find something that we didn't know about them before, we go, oh, I didn't know that. That's discovery. That creates that wonderful moment. And when you discover something about a city that maybe you've lived in for all your life, or you've just been here for a few months, you discover something, you feel like you're inside by doing it. That's an important moment. Dog friend. And with all apologies to people on cats and birds and ferrets and snakes, you just don't walk your cat. You walk your dog. Dog friendly cities have a couple of important points. One is to say uh, there are parks and there are places to walk your dog. So it's outside, there's green space. That's good stuff. But dog friendly cities would actually get us out in a different way because dogs, you gotta walk them. So it creates a sense of vitality on the streets. You know, we all want to see things happening in our communities. Well, the dog walkers are out there at all hours and they're creating a sense of activity. Stuff is happening. That's good. Um, so when you want to have He said, we feel safe because of the eyes of strangers on the street, right? So we feel safe when there's other people out there. When there's a dog, when there's a dog walkers, we're going to feel safe in our, you know, walking our streets and in our neighborhoods because there's activity there. So a dog friendly city is a lovable city. Now, how about one of these little things actually make a difference? Because Wikipedia tells me so. <laughs> but not because of the way you think about that, Wikipedia. How many people here agree with Wikipedia or know what Wikipedia is? It's the online encyclopedia. Uh, anybody here ever made a Wikipedia entry? A couple people, more than five Wikipedia entries. And of course, nobody's in it. That's usually not right. Less than 1% of the total users of Wikipedia have ever made an entry or made an update to Wikipedia. And yet, all of Wikipedia was created by volunteers uh, in unpaid uh, jobs, essentially, uh, creating that content. And Wikipedia is made up of tens of millions of hours uh, and hours to make all the content. Less than 1% of the users of Wikipedia created all of that content for free. Now, why? I got to ask Jimmy Wales, the founder of Wikipedia, that when I was uh, interviewing him for the book. And he said, it didn't surprise him that uh, people did that. He said that the people who make those entries, they love what they do. They find it challenging. They find it interesting. But there's a community that arises around these folks who make the editors and the contributors to Wikipedia. It becomes their object of love. Okay, this kind of sounds familiar. Because I think, I believe, the communities, physical communities, follow a very same rule. That means less than 1% of the total population of any city, of Steve, is actually making the content, is making uh, the stuff that the rest of us sort of uh, consume. Think about that for a while. That means that there's a very small number of people who are actually making you know, the stuff, uh, the content. Now, all of us consumes it, right? Um, in return, we pay our taxes, we lay the law, and we spend our money. But there's a few of us, a small number, who I say, uh, I read about, who are in love with their cities, who are making some extraordinary contributions over and above sort of the official actors, above and beyond you know, the mayors and the councilmen and the architects and the engineers. People are doing some amazing things. And I want to share with you some examples of some of these folks. This is my friend Bob Devin Jones, and he's the studio. He is uh, the creative director of a little studio called Studio 620. And Bob is a central node in what makes St. Petersburg a great city, but he does not show up on any sort of official city board job. This is not part of that official city making, you know, group. But Bob is one of those people, he's on boards everywhere, and uh, he's making great stuff happen at the studio. He's just one of those people that makes things happen in our city. And if St. Petersburg were to lose him, we would lose so much more than one particular person. We lose all of the stuff that he makes. Bob is important. Bob is one of the co-creators of St. Petersburg. Entrepreneurial creative class kind of guy. 
Claire was a shop owner who in, uh, uh, opens up a shop in a part of uh, the Woodward Corridor and immediately starts campaigning for other people to come and open shops. Uh, so she's looking for her friends and her colleagues to come and say, hey, be part of what we're doing here. This is really cool. She becomes the one woman sort of chamber of commerce uh, kind of uh, uh, person for that. But what's interesting about these two folks is I actually met uh, these folks here uh, in the school game. We have here at their two ladies. Uh, in New Orleans. 
and it created a sense of the possibilities. Instead of maybe doing a, you know, a focus group or you know, some kind of feedback, uh, you know, some sort of charrette, you could do something like this. And the people will tell you what they think is pretty cool for this particular location. I love this project. These are my friends Jeff and Randy Lyons from St. Louis. And they're the owners of this little shop called STL Stock. They make these really cool t-shirts that basically celebrate sort of local pride. You know, they're sort of the t-shirts that the cool insiders uh, would wear, and not necessarily like a tourist kind of thing. But what they did is they actually created a project called Group Hug St. Louis. They basically challenged folks uh, to take pictures of them giving a hug to something that they loved about St. Louis. Oh, that's kind of cool. They said, okay, well, then we'll share the pictures, we'll get together, we'll have a big viewing party, we'll vote, we'll pick the winners. Cool. So what they did, they got folks, and this one, like this one, she's hugging the white lens because obviously she, she loves like, in St. Louis. And then this one, this is kind of interesting for you guys. Uh, what this uh, made sense was another one was this fountain. The kids can play, and it's one of those that jump, the, the jets come up, the, uh, the way you're getting one of those tomorrow. Congratulate yourself on that. Um, I think that's going to be one of those really wonderful things that people will absolutely love about the ski game. It's something you can play with, by the way. So little things like that. Group up. And I know Grand Rapids is a touchy subject here, and it's a tricky one. <laughs> but how many of you um, remember the earlier Grand Rapids is one of America's dying cities. Yeah. We're preparing about this. Yeah. Um, now, what can Grand Rapids do? You know, with that declaration. By the way, it's a really kind of bogus declaration. They think they're just pure population loss. Most cities are losing population. That does not necessarily the, the mean you're dying. So I think it was kind of fallacious to do. But they took it to heart, but they couldn't necessarily respond to your claim. Because, you know, what would you typically do? It's like, well, you hire a you know, PR firm, you do a big ad campaign, and say, okay, we're going to, you know, we're going to, Basically, plus this bit. Well, nobody has no idea to do that right now. So, what did they do? Well, the solution came from this young guy by the name of Rob Bliss. He's the guy in the green t shirt there. He's under 30. He's sort of a creative agitator in the community. I think every community has one. Um, Rob's been a little bit maybe more successful. He's certainly got more comfortable doing some things. Uh, he did a zombie walk there. He, did, he put his water slide in downtown. Um, and he was uh, part of the group who did 100,000 people airplanes off the college building. So this guy's got a history of sort of creative intervention. So apparently he approached the city and said, I've got an idea. Here's how we can respond to this declaration. Uh, any folks here heard of Olympia? Yeah. You yeah. I mean, probably some of you have probably seen this because it's gotten a lot of attention. I'm going to show you a little bit of it. But Olympia is basically people lip syncing to a video, usually a popular song. And what's key about it is usually done in one continuous take. In other words, no edits. So you start over here and it's sort of everything has to happen. It's sort of like mousetrap in that sense. The Rube Goldberg machine, everything's got to work to strike. Well, this one was pretty special because this was Grand Rapids' response to the declaration uh, of being a dying city. So let's show this.
This video has been viewed over 4 million times in less than a month on YouTube. It's, been, it's worth millions in terms of advertising and PR knowledge for the city of Grand Rapids. And it couldn't be done without a creative agitator. Somebody who probably sort of makes this into March, and somebody who's maybe following it out this and yeah, he's kind of this weird troublemaker, and maybe some weird stuff happening. But this is the kind of stuff that these folks, who maybe exist at the periphery uh, of your community, make it potentially do for you. You invite them into the conversation, and you're willing to take some risks and do some of these kinds of things. Because they have to, we have to understand what it is that motivates folks like this. Why does Bob Bliss do what he does? Why Bob Devin Jones? Why Phil uh, and, and Claire in Detroit? Why you know, Jennifer uh, Cross there, uh, up at continuity, things like that. So it becomes this question. Why are cities like, uh, like uh, uh, New Orleans having unprecedented growth in terms of young professionals uh, who are flocking there uh, to start businesses and to get involved in the recreation of the American city? Why do people look at Detroit, especially artists and designers, as a wonderful blank canvas where they want to go? They want to get excited about this. It has something very fundamental to do with the way we think about these cities. And I ask this question, why do purpose-driven social entrepreneurs look for more than just an amenity-rich city? I think it has to do with they're looking for meaning. It's got to be about places that you feel like you can make a difference, that you can come to a city like Muskegon and you can get in the game and feel like your efforts can matter. That's a powerful, powerful uh, allure for places. And it's not something that uh, every city has. As much as we may love New York, and Chicago, and Los Angeles, and places like that, they don't necessarily need us the way other cities do. But we can capitalize on this idea that we can make meaning, and we can attract these sort of purpose-driven folks uh, to our cities. Because if we play the amenity rich game, most cities are always going to lose that. You know, because basically, if you're comparing yourself to, to a Chicago, and you're trying to say, me too, me too, me too, you're going to lose because you're not sure how. You've got to be the best, most authentic and skinny you can be. And accept that that's got to be good enough for the type of people that you really want to attract. And here's the lesson that I want to share with you about uh, sort of taking your disadvantage and making it into an advantage. This is John Federer. He's the mayor of a small town in Pennsylvania called Braddock. Braddock is uh, one of those sort of satellite cities to Pittsburgh. And Braddock rose, Braddock fell with the steel industry uh, there. Um, what he's been able to do is pretty remarkable as the mayor. Um, and he's kind of an interesting looking guy, by the way. He's about six foot six, 350 pounds, looks like a biker or a villain out of a bond kind of thing. Harvard educated, uh, and just was elected to his second term in 2009. And he's done some extraordinary things uh, there. One of those things was a partnership with the Wheelhouse Trust Company. Because they approached him uh, about the city and saying, hey, look, we think that there's something going on with your city, what you're trying to do, and with what Levi's stands for. So I'm going to show you this particular commercial. You might have seen a little bit of this, but you probably haven't seen the whole thing. This is all filmed in Braddock. It's uh, the voiceover done by a Braddock uh, child. And these are all scenes from the city.
do. Now that's a remarkable challenge. I mean, think about that. There's something very fundamental about the idea of the frontier of the American society. What if Michigan, and I think Michigan is the place that needs to embrace something like this, is look, we are a frontier. Come here, make a difference here. Don't play the amenity that you need. Because again, most places are going to lose. But if you change the conversation and make it about coming to a place where your efforts have meaning, as well as just making a paycheck, that's a totally different conversation. And we take a very brave or very desperate, in the case of Brad, kind of city to do that. But I think that there is room to do the kinds of things that you want to do traditionally and add that to the conversation and find those purpose driven folks who do respond to this kind of stuff. Because then, didn't that, that's quite moving. Maybe you almost want to say, wow, I wonder what Brad's going to do next. And I actually asked that question of Gary Michigan. I showed that video last year to the Michigan Municipal Week Annual Conference. And I asked them, so what would happen if we became the state? Uh, the challenge people to come here, not because it's got amenities, but because it's hard, but because it's meaningful and come here to do that. And maybe that's something to think about in our conversations about all of our cities. So these people that we're talking about, these purpose-driven folks, the ones who are going to make the content, they're that 1% of the co-creators who love their places. They are like the most powerful of spices. I'm not a cook, but I can be stretched with meat. But I do know that you don't necessarily get a whole lot of the most powerful spice. You need just a little bit of it. Because they have this wonderful cascade effect uh, throughout the food that we eat. And they have this wonderful cascade effect uh, in our communities as well. So here's the, the challenge for, I think, all of us. Uh, and I did this little bit of math here. Called this the new map of talent attraction and retention. And instead of trying to go after all of the folks and trying to get all of the businesses, all of the other professionals to come uh, here and come back. What if we were to accept that it is a fairly small number of people that really make our community? Here in the speed the population 38,000 or so, that means there's 384 people who are really making the content. I suspect many of you are here today, right now. What if we were to add one tenth of one percent for that? Ten percent for that number. What if we were to add 38 more people? What if we had 38 more cheese ladies, 38 more Jennifer Crosses to this community? What would be the impact? What would be exponential? Exponential. Those people start businesses, they make things happen, they create change, they create excitement. That's the kind of, uh, of new map for talent attraction, because we can't afford to be doing stuff uh, that we did before. What if we're going to start targeting those folks and asking them, okay, how do we increase, how do we facilitate what you're doing, how do we make it a little easier, how do we grow some more of those folks? And what's interesting here is even Detroit needs 713 more field coolies, really, to make a difference. What an impact that would have. And the corresponding, there's a downside to this for smaller communities as well. You look at something like, like Grand Haven. It could be made or broken, it could be made or it could be broken by a simple loss of 10 people. Think about the impact. What would happen if the chief lady left? What if she stopped caring? That would be kind of devastating uh, to the city, I would think. Uh, so we need to start thinking about these folks again. They are anchor personas, and they matter. They matter a whole lot uh, in, our, uh, in our conversation about our city. Because the gap between the city that we can afford and the city, uh, excuse me, the city that we desire and the city that we can afford is growing. We all know this. Coffers are fair. So who's going to step into that gap and make that difference? It's going to be those co creators. It's going to be those people who are emotionally engaged, the ones who love their city, the purpose driven ones who are going to run into the burning building and say, I can make a difference. How do we support that? How do we make them uh, what they do easier? How do more of you maybe get off the bench? Because I know you care about your city. You're here today. That says a lot. But maybe what can we do to get you engaged maybe just a little bit more? And push you into that category of being that one percenter who's truly in love with their city. Because when we love something, we do extraordinary things for it. We sacrifice for it. We will do go to the ends of the earth for it. And we forgive those uh one less than uh these shortcomings. Emotions matter. Emotions tell us something very important in our decision-making process. Emotions tell us uh, what to care about. And if three-quarters of us are not emotionally engaged in our city, it's because we don't care about our cities. What we don't care about becomes disposable. We can easily walk away from it, and it just doesn't matter. So we need to increase that love. So we need to increase the number of people who care, who give a damn about their cities. And when we do that, we're going to add the human heart 
to the toolkit of community development. And I submit to you that will prove to be the powerful tool of all in creating both livable and lovable cities. So thank you very much for that. Um, and I'm going to ask you guys to come out again tomorrow. And we're going to talk about this because we're going to be talking here tonight. And I'd love to stay and answer some questions. But tomorrow is your turn uh, to come out and be part of this workshop. We're going to ask you guys what do you love about this community. We're going to come up with some really interesting stuff. We're going to challenge you guys to, uh, to put your money where your mouth is, maybe. Or we'll put better yet, put your actions uh, into uh, uh, into the mix and get you guys to really think and act creatively and, uh, and uh, express that love for this community. So thank you very much for letting me be part of this. It's been a real pleasure. And uh, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. I'd love to sign some books for you if you guys are interested. So thank you very much.